welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Hi, this is Dr. Cynthia Tuland wilson I'm here with my radio show, Author to Author, and tonight I'm going to introduce a longtime friend of mine, Father Bob Bonello, who has written a very interesting book called Minor Setback or Major Disaster. Welcome, Father. Well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, how are you doing, Dr. Tulin? You're doing fine, I hope. I'm, I'm fine, thank you. And how are you? Great. Great. Good. Um, Good. I have, uh, you um, had asked me to put together a, or to prepare a prayer, and I'm going to use the prayer yes. for vocations that the Society of the Missionaries of the Holy Apostles use in their in their prayer act life. Okay. Gracious God, Jesus has told us that the harvest is large, but there are few workers to gather it in. Pray that the harvest master will send out workers to gather it in. Thus we pray to you with confidence in accordance with the desires of his heart. Help all Christians to take seriously their responsibilities as citizens of the royal kingdom and as living stones of the church. Choose from among your people apostolic workers, priests, deacons, religious men and women, committed lay people, so that the good news is proclaimed to all nations and that your mercy is known to all our brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen. Um, So this is uh, a very interesting book that you've written, and um, I understand also that there's a longer title than I'm than I have here. Oh yeah, the full the full marketing title is "Minor Setback or Major Disaster: The Rise and Demise of Minor Seminaries in the United States, 1958 to 1983." Very interesting title. <clears throat> well, I so would, I'm sure that uh, it's it's going to be a very interesting uh, a very interesting trip through those years as we go through this book. Yes, actually, it starts in the late 1500s, uh, mm-hmm. with the, uh, or actually in the earth, early 1500s before the Council of Trent. And I actually did mm-hmm. carry the book up all the way through just before publication. I'm trying to remember, I think I contacted you when you were registrar for Holy Mm -hmm, Apostles Enrollment Information for 2015 Mm -hmm. or 2016. Mm -hmm. Yep, I remember that. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. I'll start with just a brief introduction to the book. The book is actually based on my doctoral dissertation uh, in church history and as a few book reviewers noted, it still has the look and feel of a dissertation. Um, it's not mm. as breezy as some history books, and there's fewer site, you know, situations of speculating the thoughts of people, either individual players or people as a whole. Um, mm-hmm. Being a dissertation, I let the facts speak for themselves. And so one of the things is it makes the book less conversational. Uh, mm. Now, I did do some rewriting of the book itself, when, uh, the dissertation, when I prepared, revised it for book publication, but it's probably about 90% still the dissertation. Okay. That's, a, that's now, fine. It's full of good information. The, uh, the, the, the first thing I, I, I thought about was, how did I come up with some of the initial ideas? And I go back to the mid-1990s, long before I even started thinking about my vocation to the priesthood. I'm an older vocation, as you know, well know. And mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I had an observation uh, while uh, in those years. It was a situation in which behavior, specifically um, what kind of which which NFL team people in Bismarck, North Dakota cheered for? And I found that mm-hmm. people born in the 40s or earlier cheered for the Green Bay Packers 
the people born in the mid to late 1950s and, and into the present cheered for the Minnesota Vikings. And it was kind of like, okay, well, why? One of the reasons I, I finally came up with was the Vikings were founded and started their first games in 1961. So the people who were coming of age before the Vikings were a team cheered for the Packers. The people who were coming of age when the Vikings were playing cheered for the Vikings. And it's really an interesting situation of how you can have a time lag in something that occurs 15 years ago, 10, 10, 15 years ago, that manifests itself Mm -hmm. later. Now, this Mm -hmm. came into my mind when I started the initial research for the for the dissertation, and, you know, uh, looking at birth rates in the 1930s and 40s to find the start of what I call the not-so-post-World War II baby boom and, and its implications for the growth in seminaries and their later demise. And I'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, but one of the okay. things that it resulted in was an overbuilding of minor seminaries which was in the 1960s one of the contributing factors to the collapse of minor seminaries. Hmm. Mm-hmm. So, what I did, it, you know, from a construction standpoint, you know, just a little bit, uh, I started with preliminary thoughts. They were papers that I wrote for myself on different subject areas that became the basis of the dissertation. You know, for example, high school, seminary, and vocational recruitment versus college, seminary, and vocational recruitment. Um, and then what we could call pedagogical and administrative issues. Those would be the issues in the actual operation and what gets taught and formed, how you conduct formation in seminaries. Um, in starting to do that, I started to get a breakdown into the time periods for each chapter. I started out pretty much decade by decade, 50s, 60s, 70s, mm-hmm. 80s. But that became the delineation for the body of the, of the, of the book, the chapters 3 and 6, which are four different areas and four different types of challenges that seminaries were uh, facing. Uh, 1950 mm-hmm. to 1950 became the Future Shock Seminaries, which is kind of based on Alvin Tuffler's uh, book, Future Shock, which talks about mm-hmm. how we have challenges adjusting to changes in culture. Mm-hmm. 1960 to 66 became the short-lived phenomenon seminaries. Um, and those were uh, uh, the seminaries that, were part of the big boom in the late 1950s, early 60s, but didn't last too long. The two cases I have, they only lasted 10 years about. Mm -hmm. Then the next area was the endangered species, when the seminaries were starting to close left and right. That's the years 72 to 70, 1972 to 79. And then Mm -hmm. finally, the last category, which is the survivors, which focuses in on two examples of seminaries that still exists today, um, and then a brief summary bringing it up to the current. Now, one of the things that I was doing, which most people do, is start to compile statistics. So I went, like everybody else did, I went to the Kennedy Official Catholic Directory, which is a book that's published every year. It's got tons and tons of statistics in it. Um, And... But there was a problem with the official Catholic directory. It didn't have a breakdown of enrollments in seminaries based on the type of seminary, whether it was a high school. First, they used to be called minor or major, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, But it didn't have any breakdown. It just said, you know, there were this many seminaries, seminarians. Mm -hmm. So I started to look Mm -hmm. at other statistics, like from the National Catholic Welfare Conference, the National Conference of Catholic Bishops, the National Catholic Educational Association. And what I found was an interesting thing. Not only did they have breakdowns between minor seminaries and major seminaries, but they also had breakdowns mostly for high school, college, and theology. Let's backtrack for a second. What's a minor and what's a major seminary? Minor seminaries go back to the Council of Trent. 
back in the late 1500s, mm-hmm. 1560s. And they defined seminary as a 12-year period of formation for the per Catholic priesthood. And they broke it down mm-hmm. into two sections, minor seminaries, which covered the first six years, which we would think of as high school in the first two years of college, and major right. seminaries, which was the last two years of college when you would study your major, in this case philosophy, and the mm-hmm. theology school, which prepares you the final preparation for priesthood. Mm-hmm. So so not only did I find the, um, the breakdown, but I found an interesting discovery, which was, and I'll tell you that when I wrote my my master's degree thesis at Holy Apostles, I used the official Catholic directory statistics. But one of the things I found when I started to look closely, the official Catholic directory, let's say for this year, 2020, is actually statistics for 2019. It's the Mm -hmm. enrollment statistics for the year before. Uh And that's interesting because if you read a lot of articles written in the 60s and 70s and 80s about seminary, you know, the decline in vocations and seminary enrollments, a lot of them will point to the 1966 official Catholic directory, which shows a drop in enrollments in seminaries, and they'll say, it was Vatican II. Yes, and, I've heard that a million times. Yeah. And mm-hmm. Like I said, I use the official Catholic directory data in my, in my master's degree thesis, but when I went back and used these other sources, and got back to the individual years, I found one very interesting thing, significant thing, which was the decline that's in the 1966 official Catholic directory is actually from September of 1965, before Mm -hmm. the fourth section of the Vatican Vatican II. Second, when they started to look at the breakdown in enrollments for high school and college, I found that colleges enrollments, college seminary enrollments peaked in 1964, and high school seminary enrollments peaked in 1963. Mm-hmm. So now I had something to really write about. If the vocation yeah. decline isn't a post-Vatican II phenomenon, as so many writers characterize it, what's the real cause? Moreover, mm-hmm. if it started as early as fall in 1963, that was really too early to be affected by Vatican II or what we call the cultural changes of the 1960s. Mm-hmm. So right. what's the real cause? Mm-hmm. You know? yep. So that gets me to starting to write the, the dissertation. I now had something with meat on it that I could write. Mm-hmm. So a little bit of background. Back in the 14th, you know, the 15th and 14th century before the Second Council of Trent, Most men being prepared for the priesthood did it one of two ways. They did it by apprenticeship in a a parish, or they did it by going to a university. The people Mm -hmm. who apprenticed, they learned how to celebrate Mass, hear confessions, and do the the functions of a priest, but they didn't learn a lot of the theology. The ones who went to university, they didn't have formation programs, so they learned a lot of the theology and the scripture but they didn't learn a lot of the pastoral activities. Mm-hmm. And so Council of Trent says, okay, we're going to start using something called seminaries, which are specialized schools for the formation of priests. And they're for, pe- for young men 13 to 24, which uh, you know, leads up to ordination by around the age of 25. Now, the first diocesan seminaries Mm -hmm. were in cathedrals. They were in the middle of the city. So there was still contact with the people. Mm -hmm. But then the religious community started to step in to help the diocese. But they they brought their tradition Mm -hmm. of formation for postulancy and novitiate temporary membership, which included a lot more isolation of, of their candidates. So it's they started to shield seminarians from worldly influence. This Pope Pius XII, in his 1950 apostolic exhortation, Menti Nostre, on the development of holiness and priestly life, he starts to address this in, as early as 1950, saying, we need to have less isolation of seminarians. Uh, we also need to have 
mm-hmm. seminary formation that approximates the regular educational environment in the countries in which these boys and young men are going to school. Right. So he, this kind of sets the basis for uh, everything that occurs Second Vatican, uh, leading up to Second Vatican Council and through Second Vatican Council. Mm-hmm. And so the next thing that I looked that was a major thing was so there was a major drop in family size during the Great Depression. The average children per woman, per married woman, dropped to about 2.25. Now, in mm-hmm. 1942, with people getting married as men are going off to war, the average child per woman, children per woman, jumps to 2.5. Then in the post World War II baby boom, it goes up to 3.1 in 1950, and it peaks in 1950 at about 3.8. Mm-hmm. So about 13 years after the beginning of the post of the not so post World War II baby boom, we start mm-hmm. to see a phenomenon: increased vocations to the religious priesthood and religious life. Mm-hmm. And that generates a building boom in seminaries in the mm-hmm. you know starting in the 19, mid 1950s. Yeah. And this is the glory years in the United States for seminary formation. We get a peak in Rome in 1964 of over 38,000 students attending this is just minor seminaries, high school and junior college. Mm-hmm. Uh 38,000 students across 300 minor seminaries, which kind of gets you to about a 125 student enrollment average for a typical Mm -hmm. four-year high school seminary. That starts to cause problems. Mm -hmm. So uh, what's going on with vocational recruitment at that time? The actual issue of vocational recruitment in the late 1950s is, is not necessarily going out and seeking them. It's qualifying them to make sure that they've got, you know, that they, they're getting the right kind of candidates. Um, mm-hmm. But already in 1955, now understand, between 1948 and 1960, the Catholic population jumps from 26 million to 42 million. And they're trying to, this is the, the, the growth into the suburbs and the outer re- regions of the major cities. Parishes are sprouting Mm -hmm. up left and right, and the bishops Mm -hmm. and the religious leaders are looking and saying, we got to have more priests. And so they start really Mm -hmm. hitting the bricks for for vocation. But already in 1959, the the Christian family movement starts to detect rising parental opposition to their children uh, pursuing a vocation to religious life, especially priesthood, before the conclusion of high school. Mm-hmm. So, mm. one of the other things that comes in at this time, because they're starting to limit the number of people in in seminaries, they don't have any problem with the high school seminaries. They don't have enough. They got plenty of room, but not in the college and theological seminaries. So they start limiting enrollment even among graduates. So even though you graduate from a high school seminary, it doesn't guarantee that you're going to get accepted into a college seminary. Right. But if your school isn't accredited, your high school diploma won't do much good. And if your college seminary isn't accredited, you can't transfer your credits. So right. some of the earlier doctors start to get involved in accrediting the seminaries and the certification of seminary teachers, mm-hmm. which, which is a good thing because this yes. is going along with what Pius XII said back in 1950, start to mm-hmm. get in tune with what's going on. Yes. But there's a lot of opposition. There's a lot of traditional opposition. We have been doing this for 400 years. It's not going to change just overnight or even in five years or so. So one of the other things that starts to come in at this point is also psychological screening of seminary applicants. And it's controversial too because in the 1950s, Catholics weren't distinguishing between psychology and psychiatry. Catholics were very down on psychiatry at that time. Mm-hmm. So we have this, this, this going on. And then there is another situation that comes in, which is 
the approach that seminary formators for high school seminaries, remember we're talking 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds, mm -hmm. they look at a, a high school seminarian's vocational call much different than that of a theological seminarian's vocational call. They're looking at young teenagers and thinking it's all or nothing. They use terms yeah. like mortality rate, death of a vocation, mm -hmm. uh, and you're either in or you're out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of the environment we have going on in the 1950s. And around mm -hmm. that time, the National Catholic Educational Association sets up the seminary department to guide mm -hmm. seminaries in formation. Now, I'm going to have to kind of move along, but mm -hmm. in the 19, early 1960s, we start to see the reloc you know already in the 1950s we had seen the relocation out to the semin to the exurbs and the suburbs and one of the things mm -hmm. that starts to show up uh, among seminary rectors in the early 1960s is that they're seeing vocations still strong in the old catholic areas but they're not seeing it out in the the new developments the exurbs and the suburbs and mm -hmm. they're starting to see declines in entrance to uh, to seminaries, high school seminaries. Mm -hmm. And that would be, that that starts to cause them a certain amount of consternation. Now, there was a guy, Cornelius Kyler. He was a Sulpician. And in 1965, he does this long-range study going back to the 1930s. And one of the things that comes out of this study is that already in the late 1950s, there was a drop in what's called perseverance to ordination, which is mm -hmm. a person who starts either at the beginning of high school or at the beginning of college and continues all the way to ordination. Right. And so we've <laughs> got this drop in perseverance to ordination already starting four years before Vatican II. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, in the meantime, in the United States, following Pius, guidelines, we shift from minor seminary, those six-year, six-year seminaries, minor and major seminaries, yeah. to what's called 444, high school, college, and theological seminaries. Big mm -hmm. issue because in the canon law at that time, it pretty much defined seminaries as six years and six years. But they finally mm -hmm. got around to saying, yes, we can do this. Now, we kind of bring it up to the Second Vatican Council, and one of the decrees of the Second Vatican Council called Optatum Totius, which is the decree on priestly training. Now, the preliminary drafts of, of this decree, they address minor seminaries or high school seminaries in a section on vocation. Later, they start to expand it, and they bring forward a lot of the advice that Pius XII had given 15 years earlier in the decree Menti Nostri, Nostri. And mm -hmm. so they start to bring that forward as far as what should be the guidelines for seminaries in the United States. And there'll be high school, mm -hmm. college, and theological seminaries. And they do some things that change how we do formation. There's more emphasis on individual spiritual counseling. There's emphasis on mm -hmm. pastoral development. All of the things that, most of the things that we see in seminaries today. So now I'd like yeah. to talk about the first two case studies. And mm -hmm. just what, the case studies themselves are like 20 pages long for each of the case studies. I'm not going to do that. The first two case studies are long-run seminaries that don't make it. They die okay. in the 1960s. St. Car mm -hmm. Charles College in Catonsville, Maryland, was run by the Sulpicians for diocesan and priestly formation. They were early adopters of accreditation and the four, the four, four, four breakdown in in schooling. And in 1966, after all, the diocese started opening their own high school seminaries. St. Charles says, "Well, we can close our high school seminary and just focus on college formation." Well, in the meantime, mm -hmm. within a few years of these high school seminaries being opened, they all start closing. And college enrollments start to decline even before St. Charles' own high school program completely shuts down. 
And their college program only lasts about another four or five years before it too shuts down. The next, the next uh, future shock seminary was Queen of Apostles Seminary in Madison, Wisconsin. I picked this because it was a religious sponsored seminary sponsored by the Society of the Catholic Apostolate or the Palatines. Though most of the seminarians that went there were studying for the Diocese of Madison. Now, the Palatines overbuilt the school. They built it not just for 120, uh, 120 residential high school and junior college seminarians, but even though it was located in the country and not on a bus line, they built it for 200-day high school students. Wow. So they went through the same thing that St. Charles did. They built up their program. They started undercharging on their tuition. Then Madison builds their own diocese, and suddenly instead of having 120 students, they only have 20 students. So they reinvent Mm -hmm. themselves as a Catholic high school with about a dozen seminarians. All the dormitory space is now not being used. And even though they never fully got to accreditation, they, they opened to the public as a high school, but because they're located out in the outskirts of Madison, there's no bus service for day students, they never get the enrollments. And the high school closes in the mid 1970s. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's pretty. T- those two examples are pretty typical of a lot of the seminaries that have been open for years and closed in the 1960s. Mm-hmm. So we go up into the we go up into the uh, the late later 19, mid late 1960s. One of the things that starts to happen is writers start writing, Catholic writers start writing about seminaries and how they're closing and how this is an example of how Vatican II went wrong. It's used as an example of it. I'm going to give one example that was possibly valid, and it's altar boy. Mm -hmm. There was a close linkage between being an altar boy and entering seminary. Prior to Vatican II, you had an altar boy was the primary person who engaged with a priest at the altar. In Latin, the sacred language, mm-hmm. all the boys were the people who yeah. brought the altar breads and the wine to the priests. They assisted the priest at the communion mm-hmm. rail by holding the patent. Now, after Vatican II liturgical mm-hmm. changes, there's no special language, no exclusive relationship with the altar boy and the priest. The parishioners are bringing up the bread and wine. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things that happens is the attraction of being an altar boy drops and with that yeah. comes some of the attraction for moving from being an altar boy into being a priest. Sure. Well, what's happening that with the parents sense. of those? What's happening with the parents? Well, mm-hmm. we're starting to see a major negative drop in parental support for vocations. And it's got an inverse relationship to both family size and family income. Mm-hmm. The larger the family, the more supportive for vocations. Uh, the smaller the family size, the less supportive. The larger the income, the less support for vocations. So what we're seeing is as Catholic families move into the middle class, their support for vocations is dropping. Mm-hmm. In the meantime, marriage age and dating and going steady also is dropping which causes more peer group pressure for teenage boys to get into a relationship with a girl. Right. There's a couple of secondary effects that are occurring also. Men, and it was at that time primarily men, World War II veterans got the GI Bill, which got them education benefits and it got them mortgages. The education Mm -hmm. benefits pushed a lot more of them into graduating from technical schools and from colleges and the GI Bill mortgage benefits got them into the new housing out of the old Catholic neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. And with that extra uh, education and the new pluralistic neighborhood, we can call it, there's two things yeah. that come out of it. Uh, one is college-educated men, and we're talking primarily the men at this point, don't see as much awe in the priest's educational background. Number two, they've got a lot more pluralistic interaction with non-Catholics 
because of their military background and going to the local community college or the technical college. Sure. So they've learned that Protestants aren't the enemy. And so right. yeah. there's, there's, there's kind of a lessening of what we would call the old Catholic ghetto. One other thing mm-hmm. starts to come in. 1958, the National Defense Education Act comes in, which makes student loans available. So financing mm-hmm. is available for middle-class students and their parents. And so the attraction mm-hmm. of the seminary college isn't as essential to a boy seeking the prestige of higher education. Now you might say, well, what's that got to do with vocations to the priesthood? Where's the grace of the vocation? And that's true. We do believe that the Holy Spirit inspires the grace of a vocation. But just as uh, one of the things is, we're looking at measurements of the human response to the grace of the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit can offer the grace, but we have free will to accept it. And so Mm -hmm. we start to see less attraction to the vocations. Like I say, it starts Mm -hmm. in the early early 60s, in the beginning of before Vatican II, and it continues. One other thing starts to happen. We start to experience priest resignations and the effect of the dropping enrollments. This starts into mm-hmm. the late uh, late 1960s. We also see uh, a lot of women leaving uh, the teaching sisterhood and brothers leaving the brotherhoods. And mm-hmm. so we see a lot of the priests and the religious that were previously influences in the elementary schools and the high schools no longer there, replaced with lay people. There's nothing wrong with lay people, but the role model of the religious and the priests isn't there as much as it used to be. And the other thing is we start to experience negative attitudes by the remaining priests and religious sisters, especially the younger ones, towards youthful vocations. Hmm. There's a variety of... There's a variety of reasons for that. Some of them, and we'll see if we have time, uh, can be uh, Sacerdotalis Celibatus in 1967, which reaffirmed celibacy for the priesthood. Uh, Mm -hmm. There was uh, a certain amount of disillusionment uh, in in priests in the late 1960s that a lot of the things they saw that they anticipated would be coming out of the Second Vatican Council weren't there. But in general, Mm -hmm. we see a drop in interest and a drop in the number of people who can influence. Yeah. So, Mm -hmm. back back in 1965, Second Vatican Council passed Optatum Totius, which was the decree on formation. It mandated every country um, set up their own guidelines for religious uh, for uh, priesthood and religious vocations and their formation. And in 1968-69, the United States, one of the first countries to do it, publishes the preliminary interim guidelines for formation. And those are actually used by the Holy See to judge all of the country's uh, guidelines because they're the first ones written. And so two mm-hmm. years later, the United States has the first program of priestly formation which, mm-hmm. again, reiterates the exact same things regarding high school uh, seminaries that Pius XII said in 1950, and they're still being implemented. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. So one of the other things that comes in, though, think of the 1960s, uh, the, I, the growth of IBM, the growth of computers, the growth of statistical mm-hmm. studies, so you combine psychological mm-hmm. screening and their results with statistical studies, and st- people start believing that you can use psychological screening not just to see if a person is suitable for formation, but they see it as uh, predicting perseverance and vocation and success in later priestly life. And so a lot of attention gets drawn mm-hmm. to that. And away from the whole idea of the, the, the person-to-person contact in the, in the vocational promotion, I have two examples mm-hmm. of, of what I call short-lived phenomenon, seminaries that from, from founding and opening to closing were about 10 years. One of them was a diocesan mm-hmm. day school seminary in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania called P- Bishop's Latin School. 
And they got off to a great success. In fact, 12 years later, they, they ordained four members of their first class. Unfortunately, they changed locations about three times. They changed their program about four or five times, at allowing non-seminarians in, closing it to non-seminarians. Uh, there was a lot of movement around as far as what the program was. And then they gave up and they closed it just as those first four entering students were being ordained 12 years after they opened it. Uh-huh. Another one was a, a religious college seminary in Waukesha, Wisconsin, a suburb of Milwaukee. Mount St. Paul College was operated by the Society of the Divine Savior, the Salvatorians, and it opened in 1962 for not just the Salvatorian vocations, but for primarily diocesan vocations. They decided, Mm -hmm. they got going. They had close to 300 seminarians, and then they decided, even though they hadn't been accredited and they had major financial problems, that they were going to become a Catholic college with a seminary program attached to it. And they expended mm-hmm. a lot of resources in expanding this, and they lost their they lost their focus as being a seminary. And unfortunately, um, it was a good idea in the beginning, but they closed nine years later. Wow. That there were quite a few mm-hmm. seminaries that followed the example of or, or were similar in uh, situation to Bishop's Latin School and Mount St. Paul College. You know, either constantly changing their programs or abandoning the seminary program and moving on to other things. Now we get to the 1970s, mm-hmm. and things are going really down now. Uh, seminaries are closing left and right. Average, uh, the average number of students in the seminaries is getting down into the, to the 50s. Speaking of the number 50, by 1974, only 50% of Catholic parents state that they're going to be pleased if their son becomes a priest. Mm-hmm. Um, CARA, which is the Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate, it's a think tank of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, at that time mm-hmm. cited three reasons for the high school seminaries closing. First, the obvious one, small enrollments. Second, mm-hmm. not so obvious, and the inability to justify sufficient staffing to teach all the different courses that you have to teach because you got such small enrollments. And third, even though they may even even if they were charging the cost of the of the of the ongoing costs, which most were weren't, you, they weren't charging. You had the fixed costs for the building, and and for the maintenance of the building, and those were becoming overwhelming with the low enrollments. And so right. they started, you started to get this spiral effect. First, you get the, the seminaries closed, the vocations go down, the priest shortages come because of lower vocations and priest resignations. Now we have more lay teachers, reducing the students' exposure to priests as role models, lower enthusiasm for the priesthood because you're now entering, you're enrolling uh, students that aren't interested that have already indicated they're not interested in the priesthood, but you're enrolling them to keep your enrollments up. And the peer group pressure goes down, and you get lower perseverance to ordination. Right. So I'm going to skip a couple of other things, because I want to focus on one thing that most other stories about seminaries don't address, which is minority vocations, specifically Mm -hmm. Hispanic vocations and African-American vocations. And it's not a great story. Unfortunately, prior to the uh, 1970s, it was a non-subject. Mm-hmm. Uh, seminaries weren't interested in it. There was, uh, there was uh, not only were we were dealing with segregation, we were dealing with ethnic and racial bigotry, ex- low expectation mm-hmm. on the intellectual quality of African Americans and Hispanics and Mm -hmm. a lack of peer group, a lack of peer group and a lack of role models because there weren't that many black African-American priests. There weren't that, while there were some Hispanic priests, they were actually usually more likely from Spain, not from local vocations. Mm -hmm. And it was only in the 1980s that the National Conference of Catholic Bishops and the National Catholic Educational Association 
started to actually engage in proactively embracing minority vocations. Uh, mm-hmm. And so that was, a, that was possibly a lost opportunity at that point. The other thing mm-hmm. was when they finally got into it in the area of, of Hispanic vocations, one of the things that was engaged in by the diocese wasn't going out and recruiting among the uh, communities. It was going out and recruiting seminarians directly from Mexico and Central and South America. Uh, mm. And so, again, we had a role model and peer group uh, situations. Mm-hmm. Another thing that happened in the 1970s, and that we're getting closer to the situation of, of our mutual uh, area where we, you and I met each other, Holy Apostles, yeah. is mm-hmm. the development of the one or two year pre-theology programs. Mm-hmm. So they started saying, well, it, you got to have two years of philosophy for pre-theology. We don't have to go through four years of college, so we'll just set up what's called a pre-theology program, which will substitute mm-hmm. for the philosophy courses normally you take in the last two years of college seminary. In most cases, right. these programs get located in the theological seminaries. So not only does that make college seminaries not as attractive, but the enrollments in the college seminaries are taken out and put into the theological seminaries. Mm -hmm. The theology programs eliminating the need for college seminaries makes it possible to shrink the the entire uh, formation program down to to five or six years which starts to make the older vocations more attractive. Uh, now, there had been three mm-hmm. older vocation uh, seminaries at that time, one of them which we'll get into in a moment, but you start to see more recruitment of men in their 30s and 40s for ministry, usually from the less urban dioceses. The large, more uh, urban dioceses generally stay away from the older vocations, which leads us into two what I call endangered species seminaries. Um, Chicago's Quigley Seminaries and uh, is a diocesan day school. Two seminaries operated by the Archdiocese of Chicago. They were huge. We're talking Quigley North had peak enrollments in the 400s. Quigley South was in the area of 1,100, 1,200. They were huge mm-hmm. seminaries. They drove they drove their college seminary, but they suffered. They were one of the first ones, Chicago, to start to notice the drop in high school vocations in 62. Mm-hmm. They were also one of the first to actively engage in minority uh, vocation recruitment, both for African Americans and Hispanics. Mm-hmm. But they suffered through the vocation drop just like the rest, and unfortunately, uh, they even opened a residence hall uh, to try and promote vocations in the northern and western suburbs of Chicago, but it didn't work. They closed the south side location in 1990 and the north side location in 2006. And they had mm-hmm. some justification. They hadn't had, by the 2006, they, hadn't, they had only had one alumnus that had ordained for the priesthood uh, since 1990. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. now we get to... Holy Apostles College and Seminary, near yeah. and dear to our mm-hmm. respective hearts. Generic yep. description of Holy, Acos- Holy Apostles. It's located in central Connecticut, sponsored by a religious community for both diocesan and religious seminarians. It's a college mm-hmm. seminary at the time it's founded, in 1956. Mm-hmm. It's dedicated to older vocation. And in the 1970s, it shrinks almost to extinction. Remember, this is endangered yep. species. Enrollments drop into the low 30s and the 20s, and it's on track mm-hmm. to close. Why? Yep. 100 miles away, a new seminary, a new theological seminary is open for older vocations that doesn't require pre-theology, doesn't require college. Holy Apostles is on the is is dying. Mm-hmm. They were wrong, though. <laughs> they were wrong. But why did I include Holy Apostles as an endangered species? Because Holy Apostles reinvents itself as a theological seminary. Every, every time. Yep. Yeah. Every time we get in trouble, we reinvent ourselves. 
and, and by trouble I mean less less vocations, we're always able to serve the church because we are open to change, and I believe the Holy Spirit leads us in that. And so what they do is, while to this day there's a college formation program, but mm-hmm. it serves primarily as a feeder for students into the theological program. But the majority, mm-hmm. as you well know, you know, the majority of the emphasis is in the theological seminary program and secondarily yes. the pre theology, right? Yes. yes. So, so now we get to the last two, the last two seminaries, the survivors. There actually mm-hmm. are two high school seminaries that still exist. Mm-hmm. There's, oh, there's only a total of three of them. But there's two that actually are fairly healthy. Um, and one is uh, St. Lawrence Seminary High School in uh, central Wisconsin. It's a residential seminary. It's sponsored by a religious community for both religious and diocesan priesthood vocations. In the 1970s, it changed itself into a school of what's called School of Christian Leadership, which was more ministry-oriented rather than priesthood-oriented. Despite that, they go from enrollments in the 300s down to about 150, but they, re, they actually stabilize around 200, and that's about their enrollment today, about 200 mm-hmm. students. They're still active. They do act very active in minority student recruiting since the 1970s, and um, they've got they've they're, they're still alive and healthy to this day. Then there's Cathedral Preparatory Seminary in Queens, New York. It opens mm-hmm. first in Brooklyn as a day school seminary for diocesan vocations. It grows like the Chicago seminaries into like 1,400 students in the two campuses. Mm-hmm and then craters. So they close the Brooklyn campus. They keep the Queens campus open. Enrollments dwindle down into the 200s, but they still persevere in keeping the campus open. And Mm -hmm. it's still open today. And what they have is interesting. Even though they're primarily a school of Christian leadership, not primarily a school of a high school seminary, they have a Mm -hmm. student organization that's similar to the future teachers of America for the students who are considering vocation to the priesthood so that they can have peer group support and they can have role models of priests. Mm -hmm. So that pretty much gets us up to the mid-1980s and towards the end of the book Mm -hmm. where at that point in time, uh, the the high school and college seminaries are a shadow of their former self. Um, Mm -hmm. enrollments are one-tenth and even less of what they were at their peak in the 1960s. And so what we start to get to is, okay, why? What are the findings? Why did this occur? Mm -hmm. And it's all in a lot of the detail that I discussed. uh, You know, one of the things was, you know, the declining enrollments themselves were cited as an argument for their irrelevancy of high school seminaries, which carried on to the irrelevancy of college seminaries. Mm -hmm. Even though enrollments began declining before the conclusion, and if you look in high schools, possibly before the start of the Second Vatican Council, and definitely before what we would call the 60s, because those are the two things that a lot of people in the late 60s and 70s pointed at, saying it was Vatican II, it was the culture changes in the 60s. And while those mm-hmm. may have secondary impacts, they, I don't think they were the primary impact because the perseverance to organization, ordination was already falling in the late 1950s and the, or, and the enrollments were already falling, overall enrollments were already starting to fall in the early 60s. We were already sensing, seeing in sociological studies declining vocational support from the pillars of vocations parents, priests, and sisters. We were seeing the over-decline in in vocational support from parents from Catholic families that moved out of the traditional Catholic neighborhoods. And so, Mm -hmm. and we also start to see the cutback in vocational recruiting by religious communities and and dioceses when the the shortage in priests occur. They start cutting out full-time vocational recruiters. 
So mm-hmm. one of the things that happens, we also stop studying vocations. The last major survey done on vocations was done in 1981, which showed 2% of Catholic teenagers were interested in, vo- in a vocation to priesthood and religious life. Mm-hmm. So my, so I'm not going to get into the details of the conclusions, but all of the things that I talked to in the last 40, 40 minutes or so are the lead-in for what I think caused it. And I close off the, uh, the book. By, and people will ask me, well, what do you think can happen for, if we want to get going with useful vocations again? And I offer some suggestions for organizations that might be interested in promoting and fostering useful vocations based on what I saw as either successes or pitfalls uh, among the high school and college seminaries in those years from the 1950s to the 1980s. So that Mm -hmm. pretty much brings us to today. 2018 Mm -hmm. to 2019, there were Mm -hmm. 1,320, about 1,300 seminarians in about 30 college-level priesthood formation programs. Now compare Mm -hmm. that to 1969 when there were 13,400 enrollments in about 167 seminaries. Mm -hmm. In 2018, 2019, there are three high school seminaries with a total of enrollment of 360. In 1969, Mm -hmm. there were about 180 high school junior college seminary programs enrolling about 16,000, 15,800 actually. Okay. So that's where we are today. Mm -hmm. And that's, and that's, the 700 pages of minor, minor setback and, and major disaster, or major disaster. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a lot of research and a lot of data. Yeah, uh, one of the reviewers, you know, very prescient, you know, very wisely put in the review, there's a lot of detail in this book. You're, it's not light <laughs> reading. <laughs> but that's good. That's good because people who are interested in how seminaries have changed over generations, you know, they uh, they have a lot of data here that they can also look into. So, of course, mm. remember that I was trained as a sociologist, so I find this all very fascinating. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, a lot of people but I do think quote, that's true. Yeah. A lot of people will quote, quote there's a famous quote from a, attributed to a guy by the name of George Santayana. Those who can't mm-hmm. remember the penance are condemned to repeat it. I yes. think, and I have a preference to a quote that's attributed to Confucius, which is, mm-hmm. study the past if you would define the future. And if mm-hmm. you want to know, what, if, you, if you want to go back and start to reinvigorate youthful vocations, figure out what went right and what went wrong. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And that was primarily what I was trying to do in this book, not to make mm-hmm. a case that youthful vocations are the end-all and be-all and we should drop older mm-hmm. vocations, but we should, we should encourage vocations at any stage, you know, That's youthful, right. college, high school, mm-hmm. older. And, right. um, mm-hmm. you know, to do otherwise we, is to try to get in the way of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, and, and, you know, from a sociologist background, okay, 1981 says 2% were interested in, in a vocational, in, in, vo- mm-hmm. in pro- vocations to priesthood or li- religious life. Let's say people were mm-hmm. trying to answer what they thought the survey was, takers wanted. So let's cut it in half to 1%. Yes. Okay, now mm-hmm. let's assume that since 1981 and 2020, it's dropped in half. So now we're down to mm-hmm. 0.5% interest. What is 0.5% interest of the Catholic boys in the United States today? There's about 2.4 Catholic boys in the United States today. That means if it's only a half a percent interest, that's a little mm-hmm. under 12,000 Catholic boys nationwide who may believe they have a mm-hmm. calling for priesthood. And it's the, right. all, by the exactly. way, the, the demographic figures are about the same for girls. So, there are oh. these youthful vocations possibly out there. Let's, what are we mm-hmm. doing? I'm not trying to editorialize, 
but don't make them jump through hoops to get assistance. Reach out, provide encompassing programs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So, that's I just very, my, very yeah. interesting. And yeah. as you know, I, I, I timed this to make sure I'd make it in 60 minutes. Oh, you made it. <laughs> but, uh, no, this is this is a very interesting study. Of course, um, I've worked at Holy Apostles. I, I converted in 1988 and uh, started studying there. I was already a doctor, and I uh, went in 95 to study for my license, came back in 97 when I had it, and I work there now. It'll be... Um, it'll actually be 20, yeah, 24 years in August. And so, um, I've seen a lot of changes in the seminary world myself just in those 24 years. You know, what I see, uh, different from age is I see different ethnicity. So we have seen, um, you know, we've seen the more traditionals, then we saw older, more traditional, you know, ethnically more traditional. And now we have uh, many, many Vietnamese and, uh, you know, here at uh, on campus. And we help to train priests in Africa, in Tanzania, and in Eritrea. Um, you know, so the, the call to form priests hasn't changed. It's just that the demographics have changed. And that's something I think that we often don't think about. So, yeah, one of the things I, I worked for, I ministered at Sacred Heart Seminary and School of Theology for for, for a few years. Uh, that's another seminary mm-hmm. for what they call mature vocations, which is experiencing mm-hmm. a higher number. And one of the things that we we talked about there, and I've talked about with some of the folks over at Holy Apostles, is that more of the traditional theological seminaries are opening their programs to older vocations, Yes. To fill seats. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and, uh, really? To just to fill seats? Because well, I mean, no, I find I find there's a well, lot to argue for the older ones. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm saying it in the sense of um, if you've got 120 beds or 200 beds in a seminary, and you've you've only mm-hmm. got it 80 percent full, and you can get another 20 mm-hmm. percent by getting rid of your previous prejudices against older vocations mm-hmm. okay. in your seminary, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. you, can, you yeah. can fill your seminary beds. Uh, okay. And I'm not saying that there's an intentional thought. I'm just saying it's yeah. one of the things that I've observed. Um, I guess mm-hmm. one of the things, as we're coming to the end, you know, one of the things is, you know, like I say, some people have said that I'm, I'm on the bandwagon for returning to the glory days of the 50s. And I'm not. I'm, you know, mm-hmm. I'm not trying to get to some preconceived traditionalist uh, view. I'm just trying to open the mm-hmm. eyes and ears of the, of the bishops, the religious superiors, those who work in vocations, and those, you know, who, in, you know, in the parish life, that vocations are there at every age, and we need to have programs because we might be yeah. missing out on them. Yes, yes, I agree. They do occur at all mm-hmm. ages. And, and we're, we're, den- we're possibly denying the Catholic youth of today the opportunity to engage in a vocation that they might find is very rewarding. Mm-hmm. I agree. Good. So there it is. Yes. Well, that's, that's an impressive piece of work, oh, Father. I'm very impressed. Um. And it does have a lot of data in it, uh, true, but for people who are really interested in what goes on uh, over time in the seminaries, I think it's very useful, um, you know, because you do know where to look and, and what to examine just by looking at your numbers. So, yeah. I'm how long did it? Three years research. Three years oh, research. Oh, boy. I believe it. <laughs> one year, and one how many year to put it together? together. Yeah, three uh, years year of research. Okay. Three years okay, research, that's not... one year writing yep. and defending. Yeah, good for one you. One of the uh, unfortunate situations as we're coming to the end was that the uh, just as the book was coming out, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops got hit with the whole situation of uh, uh, another round of, of, of pre-sexual abuse revelations. And mm-hmm. so 
just at the point the book came out, the, the bishops and the vocation directors and the religious were busy focusing on other things, you know. So yeah. now yeah. I'm hoping I'm hoping one of these days the, the whole, there, it will be recognized, you know, uh, mm-hmm. among mm-hmm. those who work in vocations. Right. But we're coming down so to the last minute, Dr. Tulin. Okay, yes. Mm-hmm. Is may have a closing prayer. Okay. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. God, our Father, we give you thanks for this grace time, this time to discuss together how we respond to your call to ministry in your church. We ask you to send among us your Holy Spirit to shower each of us with the gifts of the Spirit, wisdom and knowledge, understanding and counsel, so that with fortitude we may follow your will and demonstrate through our thoughts and actions love for you and for our brothers and sisters. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Well, thank you for letting me interview you. I found it to be very interesting, and I'm sure that our listeners will too. And uh, I hope to see you. I hope to see you on the Holy Apostles campus someday. I, I hope to be out in the East Coast one of these days. That's great. That's great. Okay. Well, again, thank you very much. God's on you and your ministries. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.